Sunday night at Sunday night? Yeah, remember Sunday night. You remember Sunday night? We're thinking about it, I'll tell you. We'll see how many people's Bibles open back up to that scripture. Shows how many have opened it up since then. <laughs>
And I'm not a motivational speaker. I don't believe in motivational speakers. I believe Jesus was the motivational speaker. And if you want a motivational sermon, then you listen to what Jesus has got to say. Amen. That's the best motivational speaker I know. But if you take the Bible, there's one verse in all these verses that we looked at that will motivate you tonight. One verse that we're going to focus on out of this whole scripture, and it's probably not the one you were thinking of. Most people like to preach on that being absent from the body and being present with the Lord. And listen, I believe in the rapture of the church. How many believe in the rapture of the church? Listen, I'm looking forward to the rapture of the church. I believe that, that I, and I study prophecy, I teach revelation, I look at things, I don't believe that there's anything on the prophetic calendar that is left to be done before the Lord comes back. I believe before we walk out the doors that the Lord could come back and, right. and split that eastern sky and we could go home. And man, all them songs that we sung, what a day that will be. Amen. It will all come to fruition and we'll be in face to face with our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm looking forward to the rapture. But I need to let you know something tonight. After you see the Lord in the air, you will stand before Him in the courtroom. After you hear the sound of the trumpet, you will hear the sound of the gavel. This verse in chapter 10, where we're going to be focusing at, says, For we must all appear. The word must means absolutely necessary. You understand that if you're in here tonight, and I, I pray we're preaching to the church tonight. I, I hope that everybody here is saved tonight. <laughs> if you are a blood-bought, born-again Christian, one day you are going to stand before Jesus Christ right. as judge. Now, don't get it confused with the great white throne judgment. This is two different things. We will stand before the Lord. I want to talk a little bit about what's going to take place at this judgment. You don't hear about that much anymore. What's going to, what, why are we going to be standing before the judge? Most people believe that the rapture takes place. We take off. We go up to heaven. We kick it up. Gold dust, brother. Walking and talking about the streets of gold and the pearly gates and seeing all the saints and all the people that's coming to see us and, and all of our loved ones that's in heaven. And we're going to see all that. But we're also going to stand in a courtroom before an almighty judge. Yes, yes. And there's two things that I want to look at. I know Baptist is supposed to preach three points in a poem, but I only got two. So maybe, we'll, maybe I'll talk fast. Y'all listen fast and we can get out of here pretty yeah, quick. Amen. Amen. Two things I want us to look at about this judgment. The first thing I want us to look at is that your life is going to be examined. Your life is going to be examined. Look back at verse 9. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. That word accepted means well-pleasing. Well-pleasing. I hope that one day I stand before my God and He yeah. is pleased with my life and the way that I've lived. I remember we were, uh, when I first started preaching, we were at a little church and uh, had a buddy of mine that played a trumpet. And, and I wanted to set this thing up and, and, and those that know me know I like visual stuff. I like stuff to make you remember things, you know. And, and I was preaching on the rapture. And I said, uh, uh, I, I told Todd, I said, Todd, I want you to bring your trumpet. I said, when I get to the to the to the climax of that message, boy, we're really talking about the, the rapture. I said, I'm gonna put my hand up and I'm gonna say, What's that I hear? What's that I hear? And I said, I'm gonna put my hand up here and I'm gonna say, What's that I hear? I said, I want you to blow that trumpet. And listen, it went off without a hit. I got up there and I got in just the right place and I hollered, What's that I hear? What's that I hear? And I put my hand up there and said, What's that I hear? And listen, he he rocked the windows of that place with that trumpet. But what happened next, I wasn't ready for. <laughs> there was a lady about 50 years old who let out a scream that just about shattered the windows of that place. <laughs> Listen, the service was over, bro. There, there wasn't nothing left to talk about. There wasn't nothing left to sing, nothing left to do. That, the service was over, y'all. This woman like killed us up in there. And after the service, she came up, man, she jumped all over me. Now listen, this is a preach. This is what this lady told me. She said, you should have warned us about the trumpet. Come on, I wasn't ready for it. Mm -hmm. That a preacher right there, y'all. Listen, can I tell you this? You can be a born-again, blood-bought, 
fundamental independent King James carrying Christian and still not be ready Amen. for the judgment. Yeah. That's right. You can come to Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday oh, night, Wednesday night, cut the grass, Amen. take up the offering, yeah. sing the song, sing in the choir, preach in the pulpit, yeah. Yeah. and not be ready to stand before that king on, on that day of judgment. Two things about this examination I want us to look at. First of all, it is a required examination. It's required. Look down here at verse 10. For we must all. Is that what your Bible says? Everybody else? I don't know what version you got. I got King James. Mine says, for we must all. Does everybody else say all? Amen. Can I tell y'all what that word all means in the Greek? All. all. <laughs> you know what that word all means in the, in the uh, original manuscripts? Oh, Come on. you know what it means in the Textus oh. Receptus? It means all, oh, all, oh, everybody, yeah. every single Christian will stand yeah. before God. That's right. You don't have a choice in the matter. It is required of you as a Christian to stand before this judge. Yes, man. No way out. How many like going to the doctor? Nobody raising their hand. <laughs> I hate going to the doctor. I hate them physicals. I hate going in there and having to sit in that waiting room, having to having to fill out all that paperwork. Give me your money. Give me the insurance card. You have to go through all this stuff. You have to go in there and do all them examinations. They got to put the, the, the cuff on you. Put the thing in your mouth. You ever notice they put the thing in your mouth and they want to ask you questions? You're, you're trying to talk to them. And then, then they stick you and they poke you and they prod you and they do all this stuff. They put on that glove. God, I hate that glove. Anybody oh, else? Yeah. But this, this, I hate those examinations. And this, we, we, we can... We have been a while that probably canceled more doctor's appointments than we kept. We all the time canceling our appointments. This is one appointment you will not cancel. Amen. This is one appointment you can't call in sick. You can't send in a substitute. You can't call and say, I ain't got the money this week. You will be at this appointment. Oh, yeah. Yes, man. I wish I could get out of it. I wish that I, it was like a lot of Christians believe it. Rapture take place, God take me on up, and I'm just roll over heaven and have me a good time. But I can't get out of it, y'all. You know what that means? That means that, that every man of God who has ever stood in a pulpit with this book on. will one day stand before the very one who wrote the book yeah. and give account of what he said. That's right. Every singer who stood up here and held a microphone and sung a song will stand before the very one that you sang for. Amen. Every carnal Baptist that's ever started a fight in a business meeting yeah. or started a rumor about somebody or stirred <laughs> something up in the church oh, will yeah. one day stand yeah. before the very one who started the church. Amen. 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 Every person who is saved will stand before Jesus. Oh, yeah. It is required. Yeah. Secondly, not only is it required, it's a righteous examination. For we must all appear before the judgment seat. Who? We like to have excuses for everything you do. Come on. The one who has went through everything that we went through and yet said not. That's who we stand for. Have you heard the word bema before? You may heard the word bema before? That's the Greek word for the word judgment. Bema seat judgment is what they call that. And when Paul talks about the Bema seat, in Corinthians they were big on the Olympic Games, and, and the Bema seat was a raised platform, and the person that sat up there was called the umpire. And the umpire would judge the winners and the losers of the games. And that's what Paul is talking about on the Bema seat. There was no argument, there was no debate. What he said stood. And what Jesus says goes. You <laughs> don't have excuses. You can't argue. You can't debate. He's going to lay it out there in front of everybody. It's a righteous, righteous judgment. I don't believe that a lot of people really understand what the judgment seat is. A lot of people, uh, I, I talk to a lot of guys at work about a lot of different things, and we, we throw around ideas. A couple of preachers there, and uh, preacher's son, and some other guys there, and we, we like to bounce ideas off each other. We were talking about this one. It's amazing what people believe the judgment seat of Christ is. Some people believe that, that it's all you, you, you have to answer for all the sins that you committed after you got saved. That's what they mean. Or any unconfessed sins that you may have in your life. I was going to do it there, but 
taken in my way. I want you to hear this. I will not be judged for my sins. Did y'all hear that? Come on, right. I will not be judged for my sins. You say, how do you know that? Isaiah 44, 22 says, my sins have been blotted out. Psalms 103, 12 says, my sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west. Jeremiah 31, 34 says, I will remember their sin no more. more. Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. My sins have been wiped clean. I wish we had time to sing that song. My sin, oh the bliss of this wonderful bliss. My sins, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross, and I bound no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. It is well with my soul. I will not stand before God for my sins. That's right. You say, well, what are you going to stand for? What's the purpose of having a judgment if we're not being judged for our sins? Scripture says that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be, y'all see this, don't you? Good or bad. And everybody says, oh, no, wait a minute, you, know, you said you wouldn't be judged for the sins. This word bad in the Greek does not mean evil. Get that out of your minds. Y'all know what that word bad means in the Greek? Boy, this is rough here, y'all. It means good for nothing. You say, what does that mean, preacher? Listen. On the judgment seat of Christ, there are going to people, be people who stand in front of Jesus Christ. And their lives that they've lived for Christ will be deemed worthless. It will be deemed good for nothing. You did nothing for Christ. God help, I don't want to ever be in that position. People will stand before a holy God and he is going to say, not did you go to Sunday school? What have you done? What have you done? Will your life be considered worthless. And let's, let's keep looking. Let's keep looking. I like it when it gets quiet. It means you got somebody's attention. Point two. Your life will be examined. This is what I want to preach. Your life's going to be exposed. Do you understand that? For we must all appear. I looked that word up a little bit. The word appear means to show publicly. See, you're not going to walk in a closed courtroom and stand before this God by yourself. God is going to have you in front of the whole body of Christ. And everything that you've done will be examined in front of everyone. Publicly. We will stand before God. And all those things that you thought nobody knew, I uh, got a nephew, some of you know Chris, it was at my mom's, this was a number of years ago, and he had a trailblazer, he had, I pulled in and went in, he was out there, boy, he was washing that thing up, making it shine, you know how this guy's on the bed. He went out there, he was polishing that thing up, making it look good, and I went on in the house, he came in a few minutes later and he said, uh, I don't even remember where he was going. He said, I'm going down here to get something to eat. He said, anybody want something? I said, well, hey, let me ride with you. I, I might want something. I'll just ride with you. He said, well, well, okay. He said, we'll just take your car. I said, wait a minute. We'll take my car. I said, you said you was going. Why can't we take your car? If you was taking your car already, why can't I just ride with you? He said, well, okay if you want to. And, and I, I went to do something, and he shot out the back door. I heard the door slam. I got out there. I opened the door. Let me see if I can explain this to you. 
It looked like a cross between a fast food trash can, a yard sale, and a trash dump. There was bags and cut. There was underwear in the floorboard. I mean, and, and he's just standing throwing stuff in the back, trying to make room for me to sit down. I said, so what in the world? I said, you cleaned your vehicle. I said, why didn't you clean the inside? And it's a preach. He said, but ain't nobody sees the inside. <laughs> and that's what we do. We like that. We like to wash up the outside real good, but we don't yeah. we don't know we'll nobody see what's on the yeah. inside. Yeah. We don't want to know what we're thinking and what we're doing. Yeah, that's good. As long as the outside looks good, as long as I got my suit on or my dress on, my hair is fixed right, and I, I got I got everything looking good, I got my hands raised, I'm singing all the pretty songs.
man, Friday was such a Friday was just a, such a blessing. And then I come in here and I feel like, man, I just want to roll over and fall asleep on the pew. God, what I got to be here for? I don't want to get up and leave no music. I don't want to sing. I don't want to do nothing. I don't want to amen the preacher. I really just like to close my Bible and go on to the house, God. That was my, that was my <coughs> look that day. And then God asked me a question. He said, did you hear him speak? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He said, with your ears? Oh, no, louder than that. Yeah. He said, you doing this for me? You doing this for yourself? That's right. Come on. Why are you doing what you're doing in the church? What is your motive for doing what you do? See, God don't care what you're doing. He just wants to know why you're doing it. See, we kind of, oh, let's, let's move on, let's move on. We're going we're to bring that up here. Go back one chapter real quick. First Corinthians, we're still First Corinthians, just chapter 3, verse 12. Y'all heard this scripture before. Listen. First of all, our secrets will be exposed. Now look at this. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, listen, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. You notice he didn't say what size it is. He says what sort it is. Listen, we shouldn't have to beg folks to do something in the church. <laughs> we, 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 we sit at our church, and one of the things they asked me to do as assistant pastor there was to start organizing, which that's hard to do in an independent Baptist church, y'all. Y'all just listen to me now. That's hard. Organizing the positions of the church and putting people in positions so that when new things was taken care of, so that the pastor could concentrate more on preaching. And he was having to organize everything. We should not have to beg folks to do stuff in the church. You see, there's there's gifts in the church. And I, I'm not talking about the gifts of the Spirit and this thing. I, I believe there's two different kinds of gifts in the modern day church. I believe there's the leadership gifts. That's your pastor, your your uh, deacons, your your worship leader, your song leader, whatever. The people that's up in front, the people that's taking care of things. And then you've got what they call service gifts. Service gifts. You know what service gifts are? Somebody that uh, cuts the grass. Somebody that takes up the offering. Somebody changes dirty diapers. Teaches preschoolers. Works a soundboard. Cleans the church. Cooks a meal. That's the backbone of the church, y'all. That's the backbone of the church. And what has happened, and, and, and I'm saying this because I'm independent Baptist myself. What has happened is all of us want to be in the leadership gifts. Come on, brother. Why are you thinking the independent Baptist church is every church has got five or six preachers? <laughs> <laughs> and I ain't, I, ain't, I ain't knocking on anybody's calling. Listen to me. If you go to independent Baptist churches, there's five or six preachers in every church. Somebody gets saved, the first thing they say, oh, I need to be a preacher. <laughs> Why? Well, usually because they look up to the man of God. And they want to be like the man of God. And so that's what they want to do. They want to preach. Y'all need to be thankful you've got good music here. Listen, I've been in some churches where it sounds like a calf in a hailstorm. <laughs> I'm just telling, and I don't mean to be mean, but they need to sit down. They want nobody getting blessed. But you've got people who, who feel like, oh, I've got to get up and sing just because they sing. Because that's what, listen, I, I see everybody's getting blessed because uh, Amanda's getting up and singing. I see how people are blessed. And I want to bless people like this, so I'm going to get up here and sing too. Come on, bro. You cannot... You cannot be judged according to someone else's gift. You cannot ride in on somebody else's coattail. Listen, 
And, and, and I don't know who got what gifts, who does what. That's not for me to say. I know what God's called me to do. But it took me a long time to figure it out. A long time to figure it out. I fought and argued. You know why? Because I wasn't ready for what God was wanting me to do. And what people in church need to do is people in the church need to get on their faces before a holy God. And say, God, I don't want to be Preacher David. I don't want to be Amanda. I don't want to be Mackenzie. I don't want to be Scott. I don't, I don't want to be, I want to be used the way you Oh, yeah. Me, yeah. because when you yeah. stand before God as a judge, He is going to judge you by your gift, whether you used it or not. That's right. That's right. Whatever your gift is, not what somebody else's gift is. So you've got to find out, God, what is? What are you gifting me with? I can't play a, key, uh, a pen. I, I I can't sing in the microphone. I, I can't preach. I can't sit in front of teach people. But you know what? I'm changing diaper. And you know what? I'm going to be the best dad gun diaper changer in the country. Oh, man. <laughs> For the glory of God. Amen. I may not be able to do nothing but give a little cup of water and bring it up here so the preacher's got something on Sunday morning. Bless God, he's going to have the coldest and the best taste of water there is. Amen. Find out what your gift is. Don't worry about everybody else's gift. That ain't your responsibility. Your responsibility is you will stand before God and David will not be standing beside him. <clears throat> what is your gift? Your service will be exposed. Lastly, not only will my service be exposed and my secrets exposed. Verse 14. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work abide, which he had built her home. <coughs> my secrets are going to be exposed. My service is going to be exposed. Listen to me, folks. My stamina is going to be exposed. People are quitting every day in the church. Come on. And I just wonder how many of them are actually going to stand before God Almighty. He's going to say, Why did you quit teaching Sunday school? Why did you quit coming to services on Wednesday night? Why did you quit singing in the choir? Why did you quit playing that instrument? Why did you quit teaching? Why did you quit preaching? And I wonder how many people are going to say, well, so-and-so made me mad. <laughs> and they won't be there when you stand in front of God. You will answer for yourself. And he said, if you want a reward, you better finish to the end. You can't start something and quit. That's right. I started to use a good illustration. I started to have these two stand up and face this way. I say, when I say go, I want y'all to race. Right. I want y'all to race. Okay? Do you know where you're racing to? It don't matter. Just run. It's kind of ridiculous, isn't it? Just keep running. What's the point? What's the point of running if there's nothing to race for? Again? It's got nothing to do with anybody else sitting in this building. Come on. It ain't got nothing to do with me. It ain't got nothing to do with Jim. It ain't got nothing to do with Preacher David. Ain't got to do with anybody else here. It's got to do with you and what God has for you at the end. That's right. Why run a race? Why? Listen, I, I, I remember I was in the Army. I'll close with this. I, I was in the Army, and uh, I used to like to run for a while there. But, but anybody that's ever been in the Army knows you kind of get out there and kind of sow you wild oats, do a little crazy stuff. And I did. I, I, I got away from God. I started acting crazy, and God. And he like to beat me to death. But anyway, I got bad out of shape. I used to love to run. Love to run. That's one of my favorite things in the world, man. I, I could run all day. And I had determined that I was going to get back in shape. And so I got out and I started jogging a little bit. I hate jogging. I run a race or something, I'm good. But jogging, that's just, you see the same old stuff, especially when in tracks. <laughs> Man, I, I, I 
told me about a mile, baby. <clears throat> man, I was about to die. I'm being over trying to catch my breath. I can't hardly breathe. War slapped out. My legs was cramping. It was awful. Now, I remember being out there. I was on Fort Eustis, Virginia, up near Fort Eustis. There was a sign that said Super Day Run. <coughs> now, I remember seeing that sign. And one morning we were out in to do PT, and I'm standing out there in formation. The colonel comes out there, company commander. He said, I'm going to challenge anybody out here for the Super Day Run. If you can beat me, he says, you get any day you want. He said, you just call and tell me you want that day off in this company. Macho pride jumped in there. I said, now I'm assuming we're going to run the 3K. Or 5K. No, yeah, 3K. No, 5K. 5K. Whatever it was. Oh no, he wanted to run the 10 That's like six miles. Now, the, the, the Super Day run, this was on Tuesday or Wednesday. The Super Day run was Saturday. Brother, I ain't been doing no run. A mile about killed me now. I'm talking about running six miles. And I remember getting there and boy, I worked all week trying to get my legs straightened back up again, trying to wasn't eating a whole lot, trying to get in shape, trying to be ready. We got out there and there was a whole slew of people. When I used to run PT tests, my philosophy was I would run as fast as I could run until I got in front of everybody, and then I just paced myself in front of the person behind me. I mean, I always made good times. I, I was a good runner. So I thought, that's what I'm going to do. And I took off sprinting. I only got about halfway through them, and I got about 100 yards, and I was done, y'all. <laughs> it's all I could do to stay on my feet. <laughs> but I, 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 I couldn't quit. I wanted that day off. Man, I shuffled a little bit, and I jogged a little bit, and I stopped. I think I even sit down a couple times. I don't remember. And I, I just remember I, I was trying to get to the end, and I, I determined I'm going to get to the end of this thing. I don't give up on Colonel. I figure he done gone somewhere. Now you gotta understand, Colonel, to an 18-year-old, a 40-year-old Colonel is old. Now, nowadays I would think that, I'd be like, man, shut up. But to, to a to a four, to an 18-year-old, a 40-year-old Colonel was old. And I thought, you know, surely goodness, I can beat that man. Well, there's about a half a mile left. And like I said, I've been shuffling and walking. Here he come by. He said, Private, you giving up already? I said, I see you then. I see you then. I said, Hold your grip, Granny. Here I come. And I ran with everything within me and passed him right up the finish line and fell out in the floor. <laughs> Laid there, they'd give me bananas to eat and, and water to pour over my head. But I had something to race for. There was something I was going toward. And I think so many times, y'all, we get our eyes off of the prize. Yeah. And all we're worried about is what we see oh, yeah. in our natural eyes and what's going on right here in the church. And we say, man, I'm just tired. I want to give up. I'm through. I'm done. I don't want to do it no more. Nobody appreciates me. Come on. Can't touch the phone. We had a church in Tennessee. This is personal, y'all. Started as a minister of music there. Started as a choir leader. After about three years of leading music, something happened. I quit singing for him. I shared this with my church before. They're singing for me. I started singing for those. Yeah, come on. I quit going to the to the bookstore and finding songs that would move. <coughs> I went and found songs that would utilize my voice, so I could really sing out, make it sound really good, and that's what I focused on. I wanted everything to sound good, and I I wanted people to say, "Boy, you're a good singer, boy." I I lived and breathed for that. I got to the point where I didn't want nobody else to sing in the church. I wanted to sing all the time. Because I hated miss a service where I didn't have somebody pat me on the back. 
Let me tell you something. God has a way of getting your attention. Oh, yes. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. God shut me down. And I won't go into no details, but God shut me down. I got it. And he said, I don't need that. And one day, y'all, I'm going to stand before God. I'm going to have to stand there and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for all those times that I got up and I sang and it wasn't for you, it was for me. <coughs> what are you going to say when you stand before Judge Jesus? What are you going to hear when you stand before Judge Jesus? What are you going to do when you stand before Judge Jesus? Is he going to say, well pleasing to me. I, I just I, I, I worry that one day I'll stand there and do this thing and say, You're in with this prayer. Oh my God proud of me. There's a quote you've heard. I can't remember the guy that, that, that says it. Once you hear this and then I'll turn it over to the pastor. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ. 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 Y'all stay. <laughs>